anyone joining us tonight for the first time. If you're new to the, to the WebEx platform, it's pretty similar to other video conferencing systems. There's a circular button on the upper right corner of your main window that you can use to toggle between the different viewing options. Uh, you can even toggle between having the presentation big versus the speakers um, camera view big. I, I would recommend the presentation view be big, but that's uh, that's just my preference. You can you can toggle back and forth with that as you like. Uh, there are also buttons at the lower right corner to open the chat and the Q and A windows. And if you have any questions for our presenters, we ask that you please submit those through the Q and A function. Uh, we'll be taking those questions and we'll feed them to the presenters at the end of the presentation uh, for, for their uh, their responses. Now, for any of you who aren't familiar yet with the Center for Robert Photography and Art, we are a national nonprofit organization based in Madison, Wisconsin, and it's our mission to preserve and present significant images of railroading. We don't have a museum or gallery space of our own, and that business model has always served us well, and especially over the past year. We host regional and national conferences. We prepare and circulate traveling exhibitions that go to museums and galleries all over the country. We publish books in a quarterly journal, and we maintain a growing archive that now houses close to half a million images. Now, since last April, we've also been offering free online programs like this one. You can view all of our past presentations on our YouTube channel, and that is youtube.com slash railphotoart. And we'll be putting this presentation up there uh, within a week or so after, after tonight's viewing. So that'll be on youtube.com slash railphotoart. And for details about our upcoming programs, including our annual conference, which is coming on April 10th, you can check our website, railphoto-art.org. And there are links there where you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And again, we'll have our virtual conference on Saturday, April 10th. That will be a full day of programming. And before I introduce our presenters, and she just turned her camera off, but I also wanted to give a special shout out to Haley Page, our exhibitions and events coordinator, who's working diligently behind the scenes to, to organize all of these events and, and make them run smoothly. So thanks, Haley, for all that you do. And I think we'll see you again when we get to the Q&A session at the end of our talk tonight. Um, so, with that, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our presenters this evening. J.W. Christopher was born in Chicago and grew up living in the suburbs of Oak Park, River Forest, and Hinsdale, Illinois. He made his career as an entrepreneur when he started The Pampered Chef in the basement of his River Forest home with his wife, Doris, in 1980. Prior to The Pampered Chef, Jay was in upper-level management with experience in operations, human resources, and marketing. Today, he resides in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, where he enjoys living on his 500-acre farm that highlights 60 acres of botanical gardens. And if you ask him which garden is his favorite, he will tell you it is the one that he is currently working on designing and installing. His many collecting interests include railroad dining car china, and in 2016, Jay decided it was time to build a permanent home for his collections, which is now called Christopher Transportation Museum. Jay has welcomed me into his home and his museum on multiple occasions, and I cannot begin to do them justice with mere words. Jay is one of the most creative people I have ever met, and he shares his, crea his creative spirit generously. This is quite possibly the best collection of railroad china anywhere in the world, and we are in for a real treat to see it tonight through Jay's eyes. Joining him at the virtual podium this evening is Anne Lipinski. Curator and manager of the Christopher Transportation Museum. She holds two degrees in history, an undergraduate degree from St. Norbert College in Decatur, Wisconsin, and a master's degree from Swansea University in Wales, United Kingdom. Anne grew up with a father who loved trains, and that helped in her first museum role as an education assistant at the National Railroad Museum in Green Bay, Wisconsin. While there, she had the opportunity to work with the Christopher Transportation Collection when it was on display for an exhibit in 2017. That strengthened her passion for railroad history preservation and led to her taking the position at the museum. So with that, I will turn it over to Jay and Anne, and you two, uh, please take it away. Hello, <laughs> I'm Anne, <laughs> this is Jay. <laughs> um, we're really excited to present uh, with the Center for Railroad Photography and Art today. Uh, this is something 
So it's kind of been in the works since July and we are really honored and excited to be here tonight to kind of show you a glimpse into the museum and kind of what we do every single day and um, how Jay got into collecting. And yeah. Oh, for the presentation, we're kind of going to be doing it in different sections today. So we have a quick outline just to go through how we're going to break it down for um, all of you viewers. First, we're going to do an introduction to the Christopher Transportation Museum, um, who we are, what we do, and what we seek to preserve. And then we're going to talk about why Railroad China and the history of the collection itself and how Jay got into collecting. Then we're going to touch on some of my favorite pieces. Um, as a historian, I love the pieces that help to tell the history of railroad dining. So I'm going to kind of feature a little brief history. And then finally, we're going to talk about some of your favorite pieces. So as we start, um, I think a great way to learn about the collection and learn about how you got started collecting, and especially when I first started working for you, how I learned all about it was through some of your memories of rail travel. So would you Please share with us some of the memories that you had traveling. Sure, good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, our family, which was really my uh, father, my mother, my uh, younger brother, and myself, um, traveled exclusively by, exclusively by train uh, in the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And I can remember I didn't take my first airplane flight until the mid 60s. So we really honed in on, on rail travel. Now, our family really enjoyed history. Dad was a uh, an attorney by trade, but his under undergraduate degree was in history. And so we did a lot of travel on vacations, places like Washington, D.C., uh, to Baltimore, to Montreal, taking the Canadian National, the New York Central out to New, to New York, and um, the CNO uh, out to places like the uh, the, the East Coast. Now, we have plenty of family photos that were taken with my father's trusted brownie uh, camera. And I can remember him uh, packing that on all of our trips and uh, standing back through the viewfinder. And uh, we've got just a lot of great, great memories. Now, Really, the the exciting part of uh, travel was really the experience in the dining cars, and uh, the sound of, of the dining car chimes as the superintendent would go, go from car to car, basically saying the dining car is now open, and us kids would would scurry out of our chairs and try to go and find the dining car as quick as we could. So that really those chimes were like music to our ears. And uh, this really stood in, in our memory, uh, all of our family members. And I was always impressed by the sight of the waiters in their white starch uniforms and basically swaying back and forth on the aisles and with the motion of the train and really not dropping a platter or a drop of water. Just amazing to me. And then the tables with the white linen tables cloths uh, with the railroad logos on them and the matching linen napkins were elegant and impressive. Uh, the tables were set with decorative gleaming china plates, water glasses, and silver, and always had a nice bouquet of flowers uh, there also. And it was really exciting. We could hardly wait when we went from, uh, from meal to meal uh, to have that, that adventure. Now, in later life, uh, we really enjoyed uh, many historical trips, uh, and some of those were on the famed American Orient Express. And we took a lot of trips, both uh, through Canada. We did the Trans-Canadian trip. Uh, we did the Antebellum trip down south to the Civil War battlefields. We did the Fall Colors uh, in, in New England. And it really was a, an educational adventure. They did a wonderful job. And I really hated to see the passing of that organization. Um, the last trip trains that, that I took was uh, from Chicago to New Orleans. And that was in the older Illinois Central uh, passenger cars. And that was attached to Amtrak. And that was just a wonderful uh, trip, with the exception of the fact that those were really crowded conditions in those uh, bedrooms 
and uh, the beds were pretty hard. So uh, we've done a lot, a lot of travel trip, not only as a, a youth, but also in later life. So it sounds like you've had some awesome experiences, but is there a particular experience or trip from your childhood that stands out in your mind as like a favorite? Well, I would say um, it was the uh, summer vacations in my youth uh, that included an annual trip from Chicago to visit our retired grandparents in Manitowoc, Water, Wisconsin, courtesy of the Chicago and Northwestern's Flamble 400. The trip would start out uh, with a car ride from West Suburban River Forest to the Northwestern Station in downtown Chicago. The train would leave the station at about 11.30 and it would progress through the northern suburbs of Chicago through Evanston, Lake Forest, Waukegan, and then over the borders to Wisconsin uh, through Kenosha, Racine, Milwaukee, Sheboygan, and then off to Green Bay. Once the dining car was opened, we would head in that direction. My favorite lunch was Oh, uh, bacon, lettuce, and tomato a sandwich with a Coke and uh, a strawberry ice cream for dessert. After lunch, uh, we kids would uh, buy a deck of cards and play war or 52 pickup for hours on that trip. It took a while for the younger kids to, to catch on to 52 pickup. Uh, if any of you know about that. The train would arrive in Green Bay about 3.30. Uh, where the dining cars and most of the passenger cars would be taken off, leaving just three passenger cars to continue the journey to Ashland, Wisconsin. At 40, the train would arrive in Antigo and remain in the station for about 20 minutes while hungry passengers would scurry across the street to the nearest bar to purchase hamburgers and drinks to take back to the train. I still have great taste in my memories in my mind of the taste of those hamburgers. And the train would slowly work its way uh, on north in some really rickety uh, tracks. It kind of swayed back and forth. Now, grandfather would have his car parked across the road from the train station in Manitowish and waiting for the arrival of our train. And uh, upon our arrival, our luggage would be packed into the trunk along with garbage bags that were um, headed to the city dump. And off we would go, stopping at the city dump to watch the local bears enjoy an evening meal. So, so from there, um, how and when did you get started in the hobby of collecting real? Uh, I really got started in the hobby um, somewhere around the early 1990s. I don't remember the exact date, but my brother-in-law from Fort Worth, Texas, uh, gave me a piece uh, from his railroad collection uh, as a Christmas present one year. A single gift uh, sparked a passion uh, in my mind uh, of, of preserving the wonderful history uh, that I had encountered as a youth and uh, those early trips, and uh, it really started with these family vacations and the meals on these family vacations. Uh, that passion for family meal times and the memories on the train and everyday home cook cooking gathered the family around the table. It was really the catalyst for our family business we started in 1980, the Pampered Chef. So another, like, I often get asked the question, why railroad China? Why railroad dining? And I kind of like to use the idea of comparing and contrasting to, you know, or to show the significance of the grandeur of railroad dining. So I like to look at it comparing a couple of things. The first thing is the interior comfort. Um, obviously the image on the upper left-hand corner of an airplane, but it gives you that idea of being packed close, tight into quarters. Um, you might not be able to bend or fully extend your legs, but you put that in contrast with this photo on the bottom left corner of the Santa Fe lounge car, the spacious area to walk around, the comfy seating. You have the berths in the um, Burlington 
passenger bunks photo on the right, that advertisement photo, just so the idea of the comfort is there. Um, I also like to compare and contrast the food options. So on the left, we have a 1950s Union Pacific children's menu. One, I like to look at that because of the bright, colorful illustrations. Railroads did everything to make it a special experience for every single person that's traveling. So kids would have their own menus. Um, and the food that was offered, I mean, just looking at the right hand uh, Fred Harvey menu, you can have uh, deep or deep fried sea scallops, you can have broiled lamb chops, these delicious, delicious meals and this vast array of choices in comparison to a more recent Amtrak menu that I found um, on here, the lunch and dinner options. Are more sandwiches, which you can make it a lunch dinner combo if you want to add chips or popcorn. But a lot of it is prepackaged food. Um, it's more for, you know, speedy delivery um, and some things that you can almost find in a vending machine. So just comparing and contrasting those different food options and and prices too, obviously with inflation. But it is interesting to see how much you'd pay for a uh, lamb chop. <laughs> And then I also want to talk about clothing. When you were traveling by train, as you can see in the image on the left-hand screen, everyone is wearing hats. Like all the men are wearing hats, the women are wearing dresses. You definitely dressed to travel. Um, it was a, it was just this awesome event. It was exciting, and so you you put on your best clothes to do that. Whereas today, when you're traveling through an airport or an Amtrak station, you're probably going to see more people wearing their comfortable clothing. Um, and so it's interesting because you're no longer nowadays people are no longer dressing for the trip, but they're dressing for comfort just because the comfort level on, you know, transportation nowadays is not what it used to be. Um, then I also want to compare and contrast table settings, just looking at these images, these advertising images of the beautiful table settings in front of you. Um, sometimes you can have to 20 pieces of silverware, glassware ceramics, like all different um, beautifully painted or beautiful decorated um, China in comparison. And they even showed it earlier in that Amtrak um, menu, but the hard plastic plates um, and you can get your silverware prepackaged in a little, you know, plastic bag. And so just the difference. Um, and finally, I just like to kind of talk about service. The image on the bottom left corner is not on a train or a transportation, but I like use that because back in the day you had your porter come and he would even bring you breakfast in bed. It was this really personal experience that you had. And nowadays you go to some restaurants. I mean, those of you that not right now, but when you did go to some restaurants, um, you could order right from your table and it takes that personal personalization out of the experience and even going grocery shopping and stuff nowadays, it's all you can do self checkout. So I just like to use that idea of, you know, comparing and contrasting to kind of see why why railroad dining and yeah well, I, I think that um the, one of the reasons that I'm, i've collected living out some of those childhood mm -hmm. memories which is important to me I mean, those were important trips with the family although family orientation that went along with that and hopefully we're uh, showing the, the generations in the future exactly what it was like to live through some of those really the glory days of the uh, railroad experience so uh that's part of the objective that uh we've mm -hmm. had with with the museum mm -hmm. and the christopher transportation museum it houses many areas of interest and it includes other forms of transportation dining as well uh, the mission statement for the museum is to preserve historical artifacts that share the American story of transportation by rail, ship, and air, particularly the bygone era of passengers' fine dining experience. Uh, today, the Christopher Transportation Collection contains over 7,000 pieces of railroad artifacts, over 1,000 pieces of steamship items, over 2,500 pieces of airline artifacts, we have 400 pieces of Zeppelin airship memorabilia, and then we also have numerous smaller collections, such as Newell posts and finials. We have our circus memorabilia collection, which we have just a small sampling in that lower left-hand corner. We have salesman sample plates and Civil War colors, hotel keys, photographs, and artwork, and so much more. It's really we got we've got a lot. It's cool. <laughs> So the material for our collection, it does come from several varied sources. And the first one, it'll be collectors 
who are exiting the hobby, whether that's due to age or financial need. Um, that's one of the avenues that we will get items for our collection. Uh, we also know there are dealers who specialize in transportation memorabilia. There's a few people um, who might be watching <laughs> who have helped give uh, provide us with pieces or find pieces that help to create a great collection for all of us. Uh, then we have flea markets or garage sales, uh, regional shows and national conventions. I know Jay uh, went to Gaithersburg a few times and found some wonderful pieces. I never had the opportunity to, but hopefully in the future, <laughs> I can make it there. And then, of course, there are your daily eBay offerings. So lots of different ways that we are getting items for our museum. Um, and on average, each railroad had anywhere from two to 20 different patterns. Uh, and we have tried to at least have one representation of each pattern in our collection. And within each pattern, there were not only dinner plates, bread plates, cups and saucers and salad bowls, which is what like a typical place setting is going to be today. But there were as many as 30 different sized dishes, each created with a specific purpose. Um, so in this collection, we've not only tried to collect pieces that fully represent the dining experience. There are some collectors who might focus more on just butter pats or on celery trays, but what we've tried to do is try to get a sampling of everything to get the picture of railroad dining. But we also have tried to get give a full picture of early railroading by including other items such as menus like you can see here and we have our silver, some playing cards. The um, thing on the lower left corner is actually really interesting. That's a recent thing that we um, that Jay had his creativity came to light the Pullman display. Yep, so we have a neat little Pullman bathroom display, um, all with Pullman items. And then on the reverse side, we actually have a Pullman toilet. If you look inside, there's a picture of the railroad tracks. So people, if you peek inside the toilet, it's like you were really on the train. It's a nice touch. We like to have little touches everywhere at the museum. Um, so before we kind of get into um, uh, some of our favorite pieces and focusing more on some of the patterns themselves, we kind of wanted to talk a little bit about how we use photography every day at the museum. And um, one day that we do that, it shows us um, advertisement photos using like featuring dining car and different chinas. They provide evidence of use for us. Um, we use them for identification of what route or train a certain pattern might have been used on, how the china might have been used or how the china might have been displayed on the table. Uh, the first example, we just have a couple quick examples to kind of show you how we use the photography. And right here we have the Missouri um, Pacific Service Plate, which is the state capitals. As you can see in the image, the woman on the left is getting food served to her, but it is not on the service plate. So it shows you that this service plate was used more for the artistic. Um, when you sat down, you had this beautiful artistic uh, plate in front of you just to kind of set the scene for the whole dining experience. So that's one way we can use photography or one one example of how we use photography. Another example is the this Northern Pacific platter. Um, it is the Garnet pattern, which is one of the earliest patterns that is was used on the Northern Pacific. Um, and an example of how we can use photography here, if you know all of the, even the chairs and the table settings, it helps to date the item. So often when you're trying to place an item, um, trying to think of the time period it was used in, photography can be an awesome way to do that and a really neat um, uh, key evidence to use. And then our third example here is the Illinois Central um, pirate pattern up in the right hand corner and then the coral pattern. So if you don't know a lot about railroad dining China, um, if you see the picture on the left, you might wonder why there are two patterns being used together. Um, but what this picture actually shows us and what we know is that the pirate plate, the pirate pattern was only created um, for plates and that the coral pattern, which was uh, originally created for use on the Illinois city of Miami in 1935, was later used as companion pieces alongside the pirate plate. So this picture helps to show how those two were used together. Um, along with that, I know these two textbooks, uh, Doug McIntyre and Richard Luckin, both of their encyclopedias of railroad China, we use them every single day at the museum. Um, if you are interested in railroad dining, I definitely would recommend these pieces. And I know that they um, feature many photographs inside them. And I know that they use photography as well to help date a lot of the pieces. We actually, some of the, the three images I just previously showed you are actually images from Richard Luckin's um, photography archives that we have at the museum that he used while preparing his um, book. So 
just kind of want to show you another example of how <laughs> photography is used. And lastly, how we use photography every single day at the museum. So this is kind of our arch archival process that we do. Um, we actually use a barcode system, which is really neat. When I started three years ago today, actually. Yeah. Congratulations. Huh? Thank you. <laughs> um, I, we, we started implementing a new database system, which actually uses barcodes. So on the left, we have the sample of kind of like every single one of these pictures is a step in the process. and. On the left, we have our little photography studio. I've got my assistant, Maddie, she's actually behind the scenes, but she's the one that's taking the picture in this. And she will take it right on the iPad and it will update right into a database entry that you can access all via the cloud um, if you have our system, so it's really neat. But um, from there, it'll give us a barcode ID. From that, you'll print the barcode and then you actually we actually just can use our iPad, scan the barcode and It'll pull it right up. So it's really interesting how uh, technology has changed and even the photography that we use. A lot of the images are we use just with our iPad, putting it right on the screen. So it's really cool. <laughs> I think. I agree. <laughs> it's like we both probably think it's pretty cool. So now we're going to move into we're just going to briefly talk about the art of dining on rails, viewing these piece, pieces as artwork. Um, this presentation. It exhibits the Christopher transportation collection in the dual context of both the historic and the aesthetic importance railroad dining cars had within the United States. Um, so right here, these two images are beautiful pictures, but when you put the rest of uh, the rims of the plate, it's almost they almost act as a frame for that image in the center, really showing the beautiful artistic style that is put into them. And I know this is one of your favorites that we're going to yeah. touch on later, but this is the Illinois Central French Quarter Plates. And I just love how the color pops and it's a good segue into some of the beautiful artwork on some of the plates that we're about to feature. Um, but I think that's going to move into my favorites. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I, as a historian, and when I first worked with Jay's collection, so when I worked at the National Railroad Museum in 2017, I didn't know a lot about railroad dining. <laughs> um, and I learned the history of railroad dining through the pieces in Jay's collection. And so most of the pieces that I'm gonna show are pieces that I, I mean, that's what, they made me love what I do every single day. And I learned so much from both Erica, who is, she's here as well. Erica works with us as well, but I also learned from Jay. So I, these are why I like them. I have like goosebumps. I'm excited. <laughs> so the first one here to show you are the good old Baltimore and Ohio blue plates. Um, they are in 1827. The idea of public transportation by rail was conceived by businessmen as a means to connect the East Coast city of Baltimore with the growing West Coast. And within the year, the Baltimore and Ohio was charted as the first public rail carrier of passengers and freight. This event was commemorated with these two beautiful plates manufactured by Ennick Wood and Sons in England. Ironically enough, the rich blue design illustrates a train that is typically British with a locomotive design that was never used in the United States. These two pieces within our collection, the one on the left is the incline, as you can see, the train is moving at an incline, and the one on the right is the level. Um, those both were the production date around 1828. So I would say in the railroad collection with those probably the oldest pieces, yeah. they are the oldest pieces that we have within our collection. Um, so then like Scott mentioned earlier, we've got Olive Dennis. She, um, she plays a key role in the beautiful blue Baltimore and Ohio, China. So in 1926, when the B&O was then preparing to celebrate the centennial of its founding in 1827, Miss Olive W. Dennis, who was an engineering graduate of Cornell University and who was placed in charge with improving the B&O's passenger service, suggested that, it, that they used those 1820 style plates as an inspiration. Um, Miss Dennis rendered a series of illustrations for the dinnerware. There were seven different scenes along the B&O for application to the food wells. And then there were a variety of images representing the progress and evolution of B&O locomotives all around the rims. Uh, the borders depicted in sequence, the progress made over the past 100 years with seven representations of the motive advancements of their trains. The extremely detailed designs started with a horse drawn car, moved past to the first American built locomotive, the Tom Thumb, to the Atlantic, which was a steam locomotive that was used in service for more than 60 years, 
And eventually it ended with the Lord Baltimore, one of the most powerful passenger trains in the world at that time. The scenes then within the borders were landmarks and points of interest along the B&O's line, such as the historic Harper's Ferry or the beautiful Potomac River Valley, which you can see on the larger picture there at the bottom. So before the infamous blue was settled upon, there actually were two other color samples that were created, a green and a crimson. So the crimson sample plate that both of these items are within our collection and the green sample plate is one of six that is known to exist. The green, um, oh, wait, yes, yep, yep. And the green is the only one of its kind. So pretty cool. Known to exist. Known to exist, yes. Um, so though they are very interesting to the eye, it's really cool the way we have them set up in the case. We have the red, the green, and then the blue. Um, though they were beautiful and interesting, they just did not catch the eye quite the same way that that true blue, um, that true blue did. So creating these intricate designs took more than two years to complete. Three engravers spent an entire year working solely on the preparation of the copper plates used to imprint the designs on the china. Each piece was a product of three months at the manufacturer going through a complex decoration process and multi, multiple risky high temperature firings. The task of creating the dinner set of blue china was far more tedious and time consuming than originally imagined, but it seems appropriate given the significance of commemorating the 100th anniversary of America's first passenger freight railroad. So that is my first and favorite, a little bit why. Then the next name that comes to mind for me is Pullman. And it's a name that is synonymous with railroad dining. During its heyday, Pullman completely revolutionized railroad car construction and rail travel. The Pullman Palace Car Company and its successor, the Pullman Company, served the North American travel market from 1867 to 1968. And George Mortimer Pullman is credited with making travel synonymous with comfort, both through his impeccable service and also through the innovations that he made to sleeping, lounge cars, and importantly, dining. So Pullman introduced the hotel car in 1867 with its custom built kitchen that enabled food to be prepared on site and enabled nonstop travel with all amenities. Before this, food was prepared at terminal stations, hotels or restaurants near depots and then were loaded onto the cars before the train departed. George Pullman recognized the railroad's need for onboard dining facilities for passengers. And these first hotel cars were a combination sleeper diner and drawing room, but Pullman wanted to create a car that was exclusively designed for food service. And in 1968, Pullman designed the Delmonico, which was the first true dining car, placed it in service on the Chicago, Elton, and St. Louis Railway. Uh, Pullman successfully kept thousands of guests, railroad cars, and employees under constant control long before the age of computer technology. Uniformity of service was essential. Employee handbooks and corporate trainers instructed conductors, porters, maids, and attendants on absolutely every detail of service. For example, how to correctly pour a drink, fold a napkin, or even wake a sleeping passenger. Um, up on the screen now, we have a Pullman Company commissary instructions. That is from our collection. It's uh, 1939. There are hundreds of pages in this little thing. And I flipped through them just to kind of get an idea of how strict they were with the uniformity of service. And I came across this, this page, it's about sandwiches. And I think it is just, I think it shows really well how strict they were with that uniformity. If you look at the butter section, um, you know, butter must be soft in order to spread so smoothly under absolutely no circumstances, use or apply melted butter with a pastry brush. And then below that, it actually says, Case brushes are prohibited on board Pullman trains. So it's just interesting to say, like, even how you spread the butter, it was going to be the Pullman way and it was going to be perfect. So I just find that very interesting. And moving on then to uh, China, our China pattern that we I selected for the Pullman. And though the Indian tree pattern um, was a common stock pattern made by many manufacturers, it actually holds a significance when you look at it in the historical context. Uh, dating very early railroad China is difficult because company produ production records no longer exist. However, there is reason to believe that Pullman's Indian tree pattern China was in use on Pullman cars as early as 1881. And this is based on the China's early use at the Hotel Florence located in Pullman's company owned town south of Chicago. 
describing Holman's Hotel, the October 1881 issue of Hotel World reported that the tableware is of the finest quality, all the crockery being the Indian tree pattern, glassware is of the finest quality and in exquisite designs, while the silverware and cutlery correspond. So if Indian tree was used on Pullman cars from around 1881 through to 1968, when Pullman buffet sleeper services ended, then the Indian tree pattern would have the longest service life of any American railroad China. Interesting. Interesting fact. <laughs> Another name synonymous with railroad dining is that of Fred Harvey. Uh, around 1876, the legacy of Fred Harvey began when he opened his first Harvey House uh, restaurant at the Topeka Santa Fe Depot station. Before Harvey, westward travel was that that promised gastronomical discomfort. Um, Meeting of Fred Harvey in Santa Fe, it brought prosperity, civilization, and definitely culinary excellence to the untamed West. And like Pullman, Harvey was a man who insisted on maintenance of standards and uniformity. His standards were high, and this meant that food was going to be first rate. It was going to be served promptly in fashionable surroundings at reasonable cost. So here we have the iconic Harvey girl figurine um, who became such a symbol for the Fred Harvey company. So young women from across the country were leaving home and looking for employment as Harvey girls. These serving positions required high school education, good manners, clear speech, neatness and appearance, and zero tolerance for vulgarity. In return, the Harvey girls received competitive pay, room and board, three meals, laundry, vacation days, and free railroad passes based on an agreement to stay unwed for one year. So regardless, though, more than 20,000 Harvey girls eventually married and helped to settle the West. Um, meals by Fred Harvey. Here we have a 1957 Fred Harvey menu. Meals by Fred Harvey became the slogan of the Santa Fe. Harvey cooks and waitresses were given advance notice by telegraph of the number of passengers to expect in the dining and lunch rooms. So staff and food would be ready and waiting. The menus along the line rotated every four days and the Harvey chefs exchanged recipes all authorized by the Fred Harvey department. So what's interesting about that is that um, Fred Harvey was a chain that revolutionized the way people thought about food and dining. Um, if you went to a Harvey house at one place, you're going to be getting the same sandwich that you're going to be getting at a Harvey house in California. Um, they really came up with that uniformity of at every single one of their restaurants, you're going to be getting that same level of service. A, a real coincidence mm -hmm. that I could point out here is that my wedding reception was at the Wagon Wheel, which was in Hinsale, Illinois, and was a Fred Harvey restaurant. Really? Yeah. I didn't even know that. Finished for something to come. <laughs> um, going along with Fred Harvey, then we also, I want to show these three China patterns. Um, there are three notable patterns. The first one marked by the silhouette of the iconic Harvey girl. When you look at that, it brings about nostalgia. It's that image that you know you're at a Fred Harvey, you know you're at Fred Harvey, you know you're going to get great service. Um, then you also have the native cactus to the of the West. Um, that's going to show you the significance of the area where you're in and um, bring you to where you're traveling to. And then on the right, we have our four gold stars, which conveyed to all the passengers that they were in for a first class dining experience. So I think these three patterns not only reflected the dining standards of Fred Harvey, but they also helped to tell a story of the area and experience, which is going to bring us into my final and most favorite uh, pattern that we have within our collection, which is going to be the Membrano China of the Santa Fe. Um, one that definitely matched the dining experience that you had, but also the area and the history that the train was traveling through. So the Membrano pattern, which is one of Santa Fe's most famous patterns, was inspired by the culture and artistic drawing of the Membre Indians who occupied southeastern Arizona and southwestern Mexico dating back to 1100 AD. Uh, membrane pottery, which we have a picture of on the right, that is a photograph in our collection, um, the pottery is not in our collection, but we do have photography of original pieces. In black and white, though, there are some red and white um, patterns that are found. These pottery pieces also um, often featured stylized life form painting and geometric designs. You have triangles and scrolls and zigzag. 
And they also featured animals and sheep. And I put these two next to each other. Uh, the bread plate on the left is from our collection. And it just shows how, how much they studied the original pieces to make, like, to really reflect and honor the original artwork. Um, and so when Santa Fe was developing and designing their all new Pullman train in the 1930s, the super chief, they looked to designers to help find a pattern that would really reflect the area. And that is where Mary Elizabeth Jane Coulter comes in. She was the chief architect and decorator for the Fred Harvey company from 1902 to 1948. And she was placed in charge of designing the beautiful well-known Membrano China. The China was de designed to match the interior of the Santa Fe's new deluxe trains. She created 37 different drawings for the various pieces of China. Geometric renderings of fish, birds, and mammals, and rustic brick red are key features of the design. The Membrano China reflected the high standards of Santa Fe and its dominance in the Southwest. And along with Membrano, Santa Fe's turquoise room China also reflected the exquisite dining experience. And I'm going to segue over to Jay here. I'm going to use this slide to because I know he has a wonderful story uh, of his family traveling on the Santa Fe with the turquoise room. Yeah, back in the uh, early 50s, uh, my parents had the opportunity to take the super chief from Chicago out to LA and then from LA coming back to Chicago. And they had an opportunity, I think on two occasions, uh, to have dinner in the turquoise room and their uh, partners next to them were Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. And I got to know uh, Dale pretty well. And you, can you imagine as a little kid, your uh, parents walking in from their, their trip with your dad having uh, some six shooters in his hand and a signed autograph by uh, Roy Rogers uh, and Trigger. And uh, here's a picture of mother in front of the super chief uh, on that trip. But uh, how exciting that is, I still have the picture to this day, I have no idea what happened to the set of uh, six shooters. Brother might have taken them. Yeah, my brother. Probably <laughs> did, my brother did. <laughs> so from there, that story I think is a good segue then into some of your favorites and some sure. of the pieces within our collection. Okay. I think one of the, the uh, top uh, collectors uh, collections is really this uh, Illinois Central French Quarter pattern. And uh, for years and years, uh, I, I collected one, the next one, next one, and got up to nine of them. There's 10 of them in total. And the 10th one was that, uh, you know, that difficult one that nobody to know where it was uh, and so on. They, it was pictured uh, in a couple of the uh, directories, but um, could not uh, find one. And so finally, I think it was like about three years ago, finally it appeared and uh, thankful to one of the dealers that uh, was able to corral it for me, knowing that I was missing it. But I think this is just an absolute gorgeous set, and it kind of brings great, great memories. I know we've taken a number of trips down to uh, New Orleans, and uh, great memories of, of those trips. Mm -hmm. It was kind of wasn't that the Holy Grail too? For you it was a whole that tenth <laughs> one was the Holy Grail, the Holy Grail. For, for years. <laughs> so now we have that. Okay, and here's the uh, Chicago Northwestern's flambeau pattern. This is what we uh, would use between Chicago and Green Bay. Uh, and then we ended up using some bar uh, uh, bar plates after <laughs> that. But uh, flambeau is, uh, to me, is, is brings back great memories of our trips to Wisconsin. And then uh, we've got a whole collection of Chicago and Northwestern plates. And there's a whole list of the different patterns, number of patterns, and uh, I think we've got them, got them all collected at this point. Here's another very, very interesting uh, set of six, and this is the mission plates uh, from the uh, Southern Pacific Railroad. Uh, anybody who's a uh, history buff from the state of California understands the role that these missions played in the, in the development over the years. And it's just a, a very attractive uh, set of six plates. And uh, I know we've got uh, this six plus some additional ones somewhere in storage. Mm -hmm. And I think these are neat because this is another plate that kind of treats the rim as a frame for it. So right. Just, yeah. Okay. Um, 
in in our town of, of River Forest, we had basically uh, three um, trains that would come, and you'd hear the whistles. One was the uh, Santa Fe or the uh, uh, Sioux Line, which went right across the street from us. In fact, we used to play on the bridge of the Sioux Line tracks that uh, crossed the Des Plaines River as kids. And so uh, I know they didn't have a lot of passenger service, but uh, we'd watch the trains go past uh, the house uh, from the Sioux Line. Then the uh, the next uh, one is what the um, ah yes the uh, travel a traveler pattern um, the uh, Milwaukee Road uh, acts uh, went right behind my father's law office. And so when I would be over visiting him, I'd get to see the trains going through the intersection there. And uh, also you could hear the whistles uh, off in the, the distance from the north at night when their trains would come through. No, I actually think this pattern is interesting. I just have a quick story um, that I learned. Yeah. Um, I, was, I, I knew this pattern um, just because it was a Milwaukee Road pattern and I looked nice pink and it was pretty and a lot of people when we had it on display, a lot of people are drawn to it just for the color, but what's really cool and actually what I learned from Richard Luckin's textbook is uh, that there's a cool story that goes behind why the geese were chosen for these plates. And that's, uh, it's a man named Mr. Huber who was a senior salesman um, for Syracuse, China. He was, he brought several designs to Chicago for a Milwaukee road pattern that was gonna be suitable to fit their new streamlined trains. And none of the samples were accepted or met with any enthusiasm. So he felt dejected and he felt sad. So he actually decided to walk down Michigan Avenue to clear his head. And he passed an art gallery, which displayed in their window, this painting of these Canadian geese. And from there, he saw Canadian, he saw these geese as a symbol for the streamlined trains because they signified speed and they signified distance. So he uh, took that idea and he transformed it uh, with other artists into the traveler pattern that we know and love, but I just think that's so cool to see the geese as also a symbol for the train itself, mm -hmm. speed and distance. And then, oh, these are some of the other ones we have. Yeah, these are the patterns that we have in, in the um, Milwaukee Road. Mm -hmm. This always intrigued me, uh, being a father of little kids. I can remember uh, all the various, uh, breakfast uh, trays that we had for them and so on. And uh, when I re realized that the Great Northern had this rocky pattern, I really got excited and started to, to collect that. And uh, I mean, for little kids sitting there at the, at the table, this had to be exciting to see these characters. Mm -hmm. And even the menu featured in the middle, I know there are like activity pages and color, like all different things to just make it that much more fun for the kids. Uh, We've got two of them here. In the Grand Grand Trunk, um, I went to school at Valparaiso University uh, down in Indiana, and we had three um, lines that came through town. Um, we had the uh, Grand Trunk uh, that came through on the north side. Uh, we had the uh, nickel plate that was on the south side of town, and then the Pennsylvania Railroad that came right up the middle. And when you would sleep at night, leaving the dorm windows open, you could hear the, the whistles of the trains and you knew if they were coming from the north, what train it was. Uh, it was really, really an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. And we have Pennsylvania also. Yeah, these are Pennsylvania. We've got an extensive collection of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, China. Mm -hmm. So here we just kind of wanted to show how you know, through the museum or through the collection, how uh, photography has changed for us. Um, the brownie that your dad used to take photographs on, family pictures of trips and everything. We've got the Canon camera that a lot of pictures were taken on and how now we even use our iPhones and our iPads uh, with the database. So it's just interesting to see the progression of photography once again and how it's all changed for us and for, um, you know, in the railroad industry as well for advertisement and stuff like that. Uh, here's kind of how we've uh, carried the theme to the farm, and this is called the Dairyland Express, and um, it's a 16-inch gauge uh, uh, amusement park railroad that goes through the gardens, 
Um, you notice the um, color theme uh, for the, the car itself, uh, the engine itself. And um, what we basically say is that if you're from Illinois coming up to the farm, those are Chicago and Northwestern colors. If you're from Wisconsin, those are Green Bay Packer <laughs> colors. So we cover anybody visiting up here to make them happy. And we've also got this uh, uh, Norfolk and Western ham pump car, which is a lot of fun. It's just a small little track we've got on, but kids love to get on that and pump their way uh, forward and back. Mm -hmm. So we really like to carry the theme all throughout the gardens. Uh, and we actually, in this uh, lower left-hand picture, that's our real gardens where we have a lot of real row signage and things like that as well. Um, so we love our trains. <laughs> and that kind of wraps up our whole presentation for tonight. Um, it's just really fun and it's such an honor to present alongside Jay and talk about all the pieces we have within our collection. And so I guess we're gonna, we can turn it over to Scott now or question and answers and yeah. I don't know if we have to do anything on our end. I think I'm back there. Oh, there you are. Hello. <laughs> well, fantastic presentation. Thank you both for taking the time to put that together and for sharing your knowledge and passion and talents and just incredible collection with us. That was just just fantastic. And I think you've helped us set a new record. I believe our, our audience participation topped out at 285 tonight, which is the most we've ever had for a weeknight event for one of these. So, so mm -hmm. thank you for, for that as well. Uh, we'd be happy to take any questions that anyone might have. You could send those to, to the, those to us in the Q&A or the uh, chat feature. Um, and one that I had actually for you, Jay, that kind of kicked things off I'm just curious if you could ride any train from the past, which one would it be? What would you order for dinner? And what China would you want it served on? Oh, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll give you a nice easy one to start it off with. <laughs> yeah, I would say that uh, probably the most uh, interesting one uh, probably were the American Orient Express. I mean, the food, the food was outstanding. And what was nice about it was that you basically had um, an expert on railroads that would do presentations in the morning and someone that would do it on geology. And so they covered the grounds or, you know, the, the grounds that you were going through and gave you an explanation of how the railroad was, was uh, built and developed in those areas. Um, and then the, uh, the uh, history of the railroad uh, was was fantastic. The food was outstanding. The service was outstanding. The the whole uh, thing of traveling by night and doing the tours of the various uh, cities during the day uh, was just a just a wonderful uh, experience. One, but what would you eat? Well, what would I eat? And what China? That was the question. Uh, well, <laughs> well, they, they, they have their own China, and we, <laughs> go, we've got a, we've got a full collection of that. Okay. <laughs> Well, right away, a lot of question, a question we're getting a lot is, is the museum open and when can we visit? It's a private museum and um, uh, what you'd have to do is call in advance uh, to let us know, uh, you know, our availability and your availability uh, for a visit. I know right now with everything going on in the world, we've kind of been closed off from tours, uh, shut down just kind of with COVID. And so, so right now we're not really doing any tours um, of the garden or anything, but in the future. I would say that we probably would reopen sometime in the fall. We're putting this uh, new addition onto the, uh, into the museum about another 2,500 uh, square feet. And uh, once that we went through and, and got that organized, uh, I think we'd be in a much better position to, to uh, handle not only individuals, but, but groups coming through. Mm -hmm. um, bon chair, uh, or sorry, uh, Bon French, our chair of the board asks, um, what's the oldest piece in your collection and what is it? Well, that would be, that would be the B&O. The B&O, yep. the uh, incline and the uh, wow. level yep. plates go back to the 1820s. Yep. Would be the oldest. 
I love seeing the different you know, color schemes they chose, and I'm I'm glad they went with the blue. That was the right. Me that too. was the right decision. I know. I know. I don't know if it's because I'm just so used to seeing the blue that I'm like, oh, of course, good thing they went with it. But I was like, this <laughs> green is just not. No, it's not doing it. Right. <laughs> Um, David Jacobs asks, when the railroads ended their fine dining services, what did uh, railroad companies in general do with their collections of or the inventories of China and silver and other serving pieces? So kind of like when um, the railroads, all, like kind of an Amtrak took like how you got a lot of the pieces, but what did they do with the China? Oh, yeah, that, there was a wholesale destruction mm -hmm. as well as wholesale uh, sales of uh, railroad China at that point. They opened up their commissaries, uh, many of them, and sold off pieces, you know, 10 cents on the dollar type of situation. There were very, people that were very fortunate uh, to get that. Also, I think there were a number of employees uh, of the dining car department, so when they were closing down, that they were able to get uh, substantial amounts of it. Mm -hmm. I know recently mm -hmm. we had someone at the museum um, who came to bring an item and he used to work for the railroad and he even mentioned that when they were uh, closing the dining cars and everything that they just, they had, was like, he was a garbage bag bins full of plates that they just said yeah. to the workers, you want yeah. something? Go grab it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you know of any current trains that still do old time dining? Probably mostly heritage rail. Dining. That do old time dining, like oh, there's there's any number of them that that do that. I mean, you get down to Napa Valley, they've got the dinner trains there, and I know there's a number of dinner trains also in, in Wisconsin, uh, going up the central part of the state. Mm. Yeah, I would think there'd be quite a few. Um, let's see. Well, Haley, I'll jump in and ask one. I see sure. John Gaddis asked a question uh, that he has read of uh, Greer serving the Rock Island the same way that Harvey did the Santa Fe and of the Van Noy chain in Mid-America. And he's just curious that uh, besides the Fred Harvey Company, does your museum document any of those or any other chains that would have that would have been serving different railroads? <laughs> hmm. Well, yeah, I think... Um... What was the news? Oh, um, something news uh, out east. Um, oh, I'm trying to think. Yeah, there, there were there were other dining houses al along the way. Um, I just can't think what the what, what the newspaper one was. Uh, but there there were we've got samples of that. Okay. I just can't I just can't recall. <laughs> sure. Um, a question for uh, Jay, Charles Tuchek asks, um, is there any specific um, train or route that you would have liked to travel, but you didn't get a chance to? I would have liked to take in the original Orient Express, uh, European mm -hmm. Orient Express. Uh, travels on that, I think, would have been terribly exciting. Um, I know we did do uh, in South Africa. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the, the rail we did there, uh, which was very interesting. But uh, I, I guess uh, if I had, but it was over in Europe, I would certainly like to have done uh, some of the routes of the uh, uh, Orient Express. I know you had a really interesting trip in Scotland, didn't you, that you took? Yeah. Well, yeah, there were, there were short trips out of, from London to Dublin and yeah, you know, things like that, but uh, no long, long trips per se. Yeah. Um, let's see. Is there any part of your collection that you feel like you're missing and that you you'd like to that you're actively looking for and that you'd like to fill in? Yeah, looking for that next Holy Grail. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, there, there are there, there are some pieces um, that I, I've seen in in auctions that obviously I'm a little cheap uh, <laughs> compared to uh, other people. But uh, there are some of the earlier Santa Fe uh, pieces that I would like to uh, to have in our collection. Um, I'm trying to think what 
that shirred egg dish is the holy oh, grail. The, yeah, the holy grail is the sheared egg <laughs> dish for the uh, membrino. Mm -hmm. I think it's the only piece that we're missing. <laughs> we we have the letter opener, mm -hmm. uh, which is also hard to find because I think there are only like a dozen of those made. Wow. Uh, but I, wow. I do not have the sheared egg. So if you know anyone. Yeah, no, anybody who's got a sure thing, let us know. Do we take donations? <laughs> um, a few people asked if uh, you have any Lackawanna or Road China, um, and if you have any of there or any other railroad menus displayed. We have countless railroad menus. We have a whole uh, cabinet that actually has drawers filled with just different railroad menus. So I only featured a couple on here, but we, I mean, hundreds almost, so we've got a lot. So yes, we do. Um, and we do have Lackawanna as well. We have a case um, with that. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we've got, we've got that. We've got, we, we collect um, besides the, the menus, we've got timetables. We've got buttons off of uniforms. Uh, we've got playing cards. I mean, you name it. We there's uniforms. We got uniforms. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, I was able to to get in an auction a couple of the uh, Santa Fe yeah. um, band uniforms. A lot of these towns and railroads had had bands associated with them, and we were able to get one of those. And uh, we just got a, a drum, uh, I believe, from the Santa Fe, a, a bass drum that was used. <laughs> wow. So we have lots of different areas to give that full picture of. Yeah, and we have a lot of tools and lanterns. We have a whole section of railroad tools and lanterns too. So, mm -hmm. I know lanterns is really a, a hot area, and we I don't know lanterns that well. We've got about 150 of them, and we have no idea what we've got. Okay, we just they're just on the shelf and hanging. I'm well, for uh, like Doug, Mac, <laughs> Doug McIntyre to come over and. Uh, Give us his evaluation. <laughs> Quite a few people have asked um, if you have a website and if you have your inventory of your collection available on your website or any sort of public place. No, we do not. Um, I, I think you know maybe someday we we may get to that area. We've got so many other things we're working on right now that uh, you know developing that website, that uh, website, and the database. Uh, that's probably a couple of years off. Mm -hmm. We do have a website for the farm and gardens itself. Uh, Christopher Farm and Gardens has a website. So yeah, that kind of gives an idea of some of the different areas of interest that we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Don Hamburger asks, um, do you concentrate more on steam or diesel era China? Um, and does that matter much? Um, no, it makes no difference. Okay, to Don. <laughs> we, we Don Don's a publisher, or uh, um, and I, I know his interest uh, probably is in the old steam, steam engines. He was from Tolano, uh, Illinois, and uh, talked about uh, when he was uh, in grade school that his dad would take him down to the the, the uh, train yards and uh, let him sit in the in the cab. So no diesel. What we do have is we we've got an interesting collection of uh, promotive division um, photos and prints uh, that uh, we've got both some of the original watercolors that the artists did as well as the, the prints themselves. We've got, a, and those will be going into the new uh, uh, addition to the museum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of questions are coming in from asking if you have pieces from specific railroads um so i guess someone's asked if you have any uh union pacific pieces um someone's asked if you have any buffalo central terminal pieces um and then we also have a question if you know how many countries and that you have pe like in, in total uh in your collection if you can know that off the top of your head um <laughs> We do have an international section, a couple yeah. of places that do have international railroad. Uh, the first two that you asked about, we do have those, yes. Um, and 
the whole museum country is that's a loaded question because we do have an airline room and that is <laughs> yeah. we have countries from all over but um we've got a large canadian collection mm -hmm. we've got probably about three cases yes. of uh, both canadian national and canadian pacific mm -hmm. uh, very well i got a, a question on chat about some of the european china as well and i'm i know i think metropa in germany and wagons lips from france both would have had china do you have those represented in your collection yes yep. yes any others from europe no, not not a lot we don't have a lot yeah. i think it's just a smaller case that we, or i think so yeah but some we have not concentrated on that russian yeah so hmm. just a little area but Mm -hmm. It's an interesting question. Um, someone asks if you have any favorite movies that represent what traveling by train was like when you were a young boy. Oh, I think the well, what's what's the uh, the Confederate Union uh, where they hijacked the, the train? Uh, oh, the Great Locomotive the chase? chase, chase or something like that. The great, one of my the great locomotive, the Great Locomotive yeah. Chase. Yeah, that's that's my favorite. <laughs> Or, or or the uh, the silent one, the Buster Keaton film, the the general. Yeah. 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 Couple of couple of variations on that. Yeah, we have a few questions also about um, some of your collections outside of the railroad China. Um, can you give a, a sense of the scope of those other collections, like the steamboat, the steamship, and uh, maritime, some of the other parts of the museum? We've been collecting uh, Great Lakes Steamship China for for a while, and we've got what would you say? I don't know, maybe a thousand five hundred. Yeah, think, is a pieces of that. <laughs> well, Some of it goes back all the way to the uh, you know eighteen eighteen eighties uh, and coming forward. Um, well, it's not an area that we really concentrated on a real lot. Um, I think one of the nicest collections we have are the Graf Zeppelin mm -hmm. uh, China pieces. And we've got uh, quite a few artifacts uh, that relate to the Graf Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. And we even have two pieces that survived the Hindenburg crash. Yeah, there's two, yeah, two pieces that survived the, the Hindenburg crash in, in uh, New Jersey. Um, oh. Just kind of, kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. We have uh, our airline collection as well, um, featuring different airlines um, on the globe. A uh, more recent one we did was Circus. We have a Circus collection. Um, we had an event uh, two years ago now, maybe, or a year. But we, um, it was all Circus themed, and we had a really cool display, and even a railroad, a miniature, or a railroad that we decorated as a circus with uh, all the little items and stuff. So that's a newer collection that we have. Well, I, I got to see that for the um, for your event that that, that yes. summer. That was fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> Junipalooza. Yep, that's when Junipalooza. We had. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we have like sample plates as well, which are really interesting for artistic. Um, they there's the plates that they would bring with different railroad logos, um, fraternity logos, restaurant logos, and you'd bring that to show what your lo or they would bring that to show what their logo in different colors would look like. So just, I mean, a lot of different. Like, yeah. I think we can probably get about 350 to 400 of those salesman sample plates. Mm -hmm. uh, it's okay. an area that, that I actively still collect. Mm -hmm. I'll just interject real quick. We've had a couple of questions for people asking uh, if this will be shared later uh, for recorded and shared for later viewing. It will. Uh, that will be on our YouTube channel, and I am sharing a link for that in the chat window right now. I also put up a link for uh, your website in the chat window, so anyone looking for those can find both of them in the chat right now. Yes, um, and forgive me for my my pause and commentary. We have, I think, one of our most active chat and Q and A feeds going <laughs> right now, so I'm trying to filter through there. Um, someone asks, "Do you plan to add some modern day Amtrak?" Um, you mean the paper plates? Paper. The plastic plates. <laughs> <laughs> we we do have examples of that. You know, uh, we've got the hall patterns. You know. We have the blue china too. The extract blue. Yeah. Yep. We've got, we've got some pieces of, of the more modern mm -hmm. Amtrak. 
Mm -hmm. um, and another person asks, um, this is a probably a bit of a subjective question, but what do you think is the most rare China pattern in the 21st century or maybe the 20th century? I think maybe some of the, the real early um, Santa Fe uh, to me is kind of exciting, kind of like maybe the Holy Grail right now uh, for pieces that we'd be, be looking for. Scott, do you have any other um, ones that we haven't really covered on your end? Well, I saw one that, and this might be for you, but uh, we had one person, and, and we're curious about this too, as, as, as fellow archivists, just to elaborate a little bit more on the database uh, system that you use for, um, you know, for, for cataloging all this, and and um, uh, particularly how you create the spark codes. Yeah, um, so we use a FileMaker as our database system, and um, it's, we wanted to, when we first started, Jay talks about how cool it would be to have barcodes on items that you just scan, find like what it is, where it is. And so we worked with a couple of people to work on the FileMaker system to get it to do that. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, you can also get FileMaker Pro an app for an iPhone or an iPad, which is where the iPad comes into play. But it's so easy. You just create an entry and then you can just add the image right there. Um, we do so when we do that, it's going to give each item a new number, and then that item number, which is going to be the barcode ID, we then have a separate um, label printer that will enter that barcode ID in to print off the stickers, and that's kind of the process. So we first take the photograph, put the item into the database, um, get that barcode, print that on a separate label printer, and our, our uh, iPad then will read that in the camera. There's an area in our database that'll just say scan barcode and it'll pull up each item just based on the barcode. So it's really cool. It'll tell us exactly where it's located, which yeah. case it's located in, who we purchased it from, and all the information just in one simple little barcode. So it's kind of kind of cool. And it's totally different than the process, the another, you know, the archivist process where it's you paint the glue on and you use the archive pen and then you wait for it to dry. So a little sticker, it's still different just putting a sticker on it, but it's cool to see how far things have come. Mm. <laughs> Oh, and here's here's a question I think we, we missed earlier, but I I have a, a personal interest in too. I know we talked about the menus, um, and we also mentioned earlier one of our participants tonight, Jim Porterfield, has done done a book uh, about uh, uh, recipes, and um, I'm curious to know, and another at least one of our attendees is curious to know if there are recipes for cocktails that were regularly served aboard the the trains. Mm -hmm. There were, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking I know the cocktail menus, but there would be, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw something recently on, on that. And I, I can't really remember exactly where it was. Huh. That was Sounds good. like a follow up, uh, follow up topic. <laughs> I know. I was like, I'm going to research this. Now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a sampling at the museum. One day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we'll be we'll there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really interesting. Uh, I think it was last year uh, for my birthday. Um, they decided to hold a birthday lunch over at the museum. And so the theme was they used all the Pullman um, China that we had <laughs> serving dishes and uh, the plates and cups and so on. I thought it was really kind of a, an interesting uh, birthday surprise. <laughs> I think we even use the button. Yeah. <laughs> I know you mentioned you have a lot of menus. Um, we've had quite a few questions specifically about um, recipe cookbooks. If you have any of those in your collection, and if you've tried to make any recipes from those cookbooks. In fact, we just got yeah, one uh, we this week. We got we got one. I think it was was it Chesapeake in Ohio? Uh, I think it just yeah. I think yeah. I just sent yeah. it over there. Uh, you know, I think yeah, you know. a lot of them were like uh, certain seafood uh, recipes, but uh, sounded sounded interesting. We've got quite a few books on that. I know I tried to make a Southern Pacific cantaloupe pie one time, 
don't recommend <laughs> it was interesting i might have just really failed at following the directions but it was a whole like i'm gonna try a railroad recipe and for some reason that's what i decided to do it had like cottage cheese in it and it was just yeah it was an adventure so yes i have tried to make something <laughs> I don't know how cantaloupe pie sounds. No, I, know, I don't know. What it is. <laughs> it's, a, it's a running joke with some people that try it. Is. So yeah. Um, we have a few questions about the you know collecting in general, and if Jay, you have any suggestions for new collectors on like maybe resources that that could help them, like with making price guidelines or. Um, you know, places to look for these types of pieces. I think the place to start is probably the, the two uh, uh, best known books uh, by McIntyre and Lookin. That uh, that gives you kind of like a, an overview. Um, they've got some pricing guidelines in there, but pricing is what the market will bear, is what it really is. Uh, today, uh, I think some of the uh, we're kind of like on a downside slide a little bit on, on the pricing on some on some items, unless they're they're really rare items. Um, but you can look on, on like on eBay, and that'll give you some idea of what people are asking for uh, and what you know some of the prices realized and so on. Um, I think what you've got to do is is find out what your interest it is. You know whether that interest is a particular railroad, and if that's that's the case, start with with collecting uh, items from that railroad. Um, I wouldn't go too, too shotgun on it, um, but I think the, the beauty of it is collecting complete place settings uh, of, of those patterns and so on. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, how do things look on your end, Scott? Well, it looks like we've gotten through most everything. I'm sure we missed a few, but... Uh... Um, yeah, I apologize for all the great wanted, questions. Yeah, whose questions weren't answered. We had an outstanding number of <laughs> of comments and questions filter in over the past 30 minutes or so. So it's great to see that participation. Oh, and, and Tim Stewie mentioned to me on chat that there was a book called Drinks that was issued to every Pullman car serving drinks. So it sounds like that's a, a resource we'll need for our future uh, railroad <laughs> cocktail tasting. <laughs> I think this needs to happen. Yeah. You, know, the other, you, you can also look uh, for pricing. Is there's a number of auctions, both on you know online and so on. Uh, there's uh, Susan, uh, no. Su yes, uh, Susan knows out of out of uh, Colorado. You've got uh, Golden Spike uh, out of uh, Arlington, uh, Virginia, and so on. If you get their catalogs, their auction catalogs. You get a pretty good idea of what's in the market and what the asking price is. And Jay, this this might be a, a follow up question to that, and and perhaps exacerbated by the the times we're in right now. But what do you see as the future for kind of the the big train shows like Gaithersburg versus online auctions? How do you see those trends playing out? Well, I would say that there's there's no substitute. Uh, for going to uh, a uh, a Gaithersburg or you know some of the local ones because you've got uh, you get to meet uh, people that are selling and I think that's so important and they also tend to bring things that they may not have in an auction an auction doesn't cover everything uh, I think it's the camaraderie of going to those shows uh, meeting the people uh, that that to me is the, the important thing. Um, you know, it, it, it's somewhat of, of a dying hobby, uh, which concerns me a little bit. We got to get more young people into the, into the, uh, into the realm here. Um, but hearing the stories, uh, hearing the background of the experiences that these people had working for the railroads is just a lot of fun to sit down and talk. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, uh, I guess that segues into uh, just thanking both of you for, for virtually at least sharing some of your, your passion and enthusiasm with us tonight and, and giving our uh, 285 participants a chance to, to at least have the electronic version of, of uh, getting, to, getting to meet you directly. Uh, so 
thank you both so much for putting this together. This was a just a wonderful and highly worthwhile evening. Uh, and we really appreciate all the time that went into it and and all of your incredible expertise in sharing that with us. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Our, we enjoy it. Our absolute pleasure, and uh, we'll look forward to following up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good thank luck. You. Good luck with those additions, and uh, and Anne, congratulations on your on your three year anniversary. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and and good luck with those forthcoming additions. We'll be we'll be looking forward to the progress reports and the cocktail party. So yeah, we'll be in touch. Uh, yes, okay. keep us posted <laughs> about that. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. All right, thank you. All right. Oh, thank thanks you again. Have a great night. You thanks too. everyone for joining us tonight, and uh, we'll uh, we'll have another one of these at the end of March. Uh, I believe March twenty third. Is that right, Haley? Yep, that sounds right. Yeah, BB and Clegg on March 23rd, and then our virtual conference all day Saturday, April 10th. Details about both of those on our website, railphoto-art.org. Uh, until then, we'll uh, see you next time, and thanks again for joining us. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye.